Appreciate you watching Grace Believers Bible Study. I uh, would we'll ask you to turn with me in the scripture today to Colossians chapter 1. I uh, appreciate the ones of you that have called and those of you that have written about watching the program. I appreciate very much uh, your response. If you have a response, we'd be glad to hear from you. Anything you have to say and uh, maybe you have some criticism about the broadcast. That'll be all right, too. We'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, I want you to read with me today in Colossians uh, chapter 1. And uh, before we read, yeah, I want to mention to you that <clears throat> we've been talking about common salvation. And I've been talking about the fact that salvation is not always common throughout the Scripture. And uh, we had gotten to the place of uh, the writings of John, and we were talking about John because uh, most of the fundamentalists today believe that the plan of salvation for the church, which is the body of Christ, <coughs> is in the book of John, or it's in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, or the book of Revelation. And uh, so uh, there's been some criticism about the broadcast uh, and about our teaching. Uh, the idea is that we do not believe that all the scripture is given for us. That's the criticism that has been made. But I want to tell you right now, I, along with all the others that I know of today that preach and teach along the lines that I preach, pertaining to rightly dividing the word, we believe that all of the Bible is given for our inspiration and our uh, learning. We believe that Genesis through Revelation is written for our admonition and our learning. But Paul's epistles are written unto us. And I realize that there is doctrine in Genesis, there is doctrine in Revelation for the admonition of those that are in the church, which is the body of Christ. But the salvation of individuals in this age, the doctrine of salvation, the gospel of salvation and so forth, are in Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon. We emphasize that. We've emphasized that before, and we'll continue to emphasize that. And in spite of the fact that we do that, there will still be people who are going to tell you that we don't believe the Bible, but we do believe the Bible. I believe the Bible means exactly what it says, as it says it, where it says it. I may not understand what it is saying. I may not be able to... Uh, interpret the passage, so to speak, but the scripture will interpret itself according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. We must compare spiritual things with spiritual things, and that is our aim. That is what we plan to do. That is what we've always tried to do. So I believe all of the Bible is given for our admonition, our learning. I believe all the Bible is inspired of God, I believe the Bible is God's holy word, and I'm talking about the King James Bible, and I believe the Bible means exactly what it says, as it says it, where it says it. It does not need my interpretation. It does not need for me to add a word here and there to make the Bible say what I want it to say. I have no organization for you to join I do not ask you for your money. We believe that God Almighty is able to make all grace abound toward us, that we always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work in the Lord. And Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, that God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God has done that. And we've never begged anyone for money. We don't ask anybody for a dime. Our aim is not to preach some doctrine in order that you might follow us, that you might join our organization, or that you might send us money. Our aim is to preach the gospel to the lost. Our aim is to make men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, 
That is, make men to see that Jesus Christ died for you. Make men see that Jesus Christ died for all men. Make men see that Jesus Christ didn't die just for those who repent of their sins and get baptized and whatever, but Jesus Christ died for drunks. Jesus Christ died for whores. Jesus Christ died for whoremongers. Jesus Christ died for all, and all can be saved if they'll trust Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. You can be saved. Your mother and your daddy can be saved. Your children can be saved. Any drunk, any murderer, any dope addict, any harlot, anybody you know of today can be saved and received. They, they, they can be acceptable to God if they will receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. <clears throat> now this Bible is emphatic about that. It is clear about that. But you do not find that truth in this Bible other than through Paul's epistles. It is through the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the Gentiles, that God made known to you that Jesus Christ gave himself for all men. In Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus Christ sent the apostles out, he said, Go not in the way of the Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said in Matthew 15, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It is not our aim to make you believe that any foreigner, any sinner could not have been saved in that ministry. Yes, they could. They could have been saved by repenting, turning from their idols, turning to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, turning to the ministry that was preached at that time. But the gospel of the grace of God was not being preached at that time. Men were not saved with eternal security at that time. They were told you must endure to the end. The gospel that was being preached was the gospel of the kingdom, and the gospel of the kingdom is not preached unto you that are listening to my voice right now. Now notice something that Paul says in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read from verse 23, the very last few words of verse 23. Read with me, please. I... Paul, I made a minister, verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, there are two things in that passage that I want you to notice. <clears throat> Number one, Paul, in his sufferings, filled up the sufferings of Jesus Christ for the church, the body of Christ. Now that's what it said. Verse 24, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now the apostle Paul did not suffer on the cross for you. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul did not die at Calvary for you. But after Jesus Christ died, no one knew that Jesus Christ died for your sins. And whoever was going to preach that truth to you was going to suffer. But Jesus Christ couldn't do it. Jesus Christ had already suffered. Jesus Christ had already died. He had been buried, risen, and glorified. Therefore, Jesus Christ could not undo that. He could not come back. He could not suffer that which would have to be suffered as a result of preaching that truth to you. The apostle Paul went about and was stoned by men. Uh, he was beaten. He was thrown in prison. 
and on and on for preaching this truth. That's the filling up of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now let me put on the board up here. Let's just say that here's the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ died <clears throat> on the cross, God Almighty had you in mind. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And the Bible is clear as in Romans. Hold on to Colossians and turn to Romans and look in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Well, who did Christ die for? He died for ungodly people. Jesus Christ died for all. He died for ungodly people. Are you an ungodly sinner? Then Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ didn't say that if you'll repent of your sins, get baptized and join the church and keep the commandments, then you can believe in me as your Lord and Savior. No. Jesus Christ died for you when you were yet unable to help yourself. Notice in verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Who did Christ die for? Well, he died for ungodly, and he died for sinners. Say, well, if an individual will quit being an ungodly sinner, then he can get saved. No, an individual who is an ungodly sinner right now can get saved right now if they'll trust Christ, their Lord and Savior. God Almighty gave His Son to die for you. When Jesus Christ died upon Calvary, God took your sins and placed upon His Son and made His Son to be sin for you that you might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Won't you trust Him? Why will you turn away from the Lord? Why will you insist on praying at the altar, trying to attain something that God says you cannot attain? You cannot save yourself. You cannot quit being what you are. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verse 12, By one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that there is none good, no, not one. The Bible said there is not one just person on earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All are the same. There is no difference. Every individual that you know of today was born in sin. You were condemned and are condemned today unless you've trusted Christ your Lord and Savior, but you're condemned as a result of sin in you. God said to Adam, Adam, you're not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Adam ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. As a result of that, he had to get out of the garden. He had to leave the Garden of Eden. Why? Because sin entered into him. And he could not stay where God is with sin. The Bible said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You that are listening to my voice cannot get to where God is no matter if you never danced, played cards, watched bad movies, no matter if you're, if you're not an adulterer, if you're not a fornicator, if you're not a whore or a whoremonger, no matter if you're not a drunk, and on and on and on, you are born in sin, and sin is in you, and you cannot get to where God is as long as that's true. Something has to be done. 
and God knew you had no choice in the matter. You didn't choose to be born. You didn't choose the place of your birth, the day of your birth. You didn't choose to be born under your parents. You didn't choose to be born with sin in you, an evil nature within you, an evil heart in you, as in Mark chapter 7. You didn't choose that. And so you say, well, then why would God hold it against me? But God cannot take you into his presence in that condition. And God loved you and wanted you. And therefore, God gave his son on Calvary to die for your sin. By one man, sin entered and God made him to be sin for you. And therefore, the death of Christ at Calvary cancels the power of the sin that entered into you through Adam. So God gave you a choice. You can choose Christ. You can receive Christ as your Savior, and the sin that brings death is canceled. And you don't have to experience death. Jesus Christ died for sinners. Now, Peter didn't know in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 that Jesus Christ died for you. He did not believe that. In fact, when Jesus Christ in Matthew 16, when Jesus Christ told Peter, I'm going up to Jerusalem and I'm going to die, and after three days rise from the dead, Peter said, Not so, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. In the garden of Gethsemane, when they came to get Jesus. Peter drew a sword and began to fight. He's going to stop this. He's not going to allow Jesus Christ to die on Calvary. Why? Because he did not believe and did not know and did not understand that Jesus Christ was dying for his sins. And so he's going to stop his death. How could he have been preaching that Christ died for your sins when he didn't even believe that Jesus Christ ought to die? But that isn't all. After Jesus Christ died, the morning after the resurrection, Peter did not believe that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. He and John both ran to the tomb and ran inside the tomb and saw the linen clothes lie. And until then, they had not believed in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 2, through 4, 5, 6, 7, Peter didn't believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. And in Acts chapter 10, he told Cornelius, he said, I finally see this thing. He said, in every nation, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is acceptable to him. He didn't know this message that Paul preached. Paul said, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So therefore, for God to get the message that Jesus Christ died for sinners such as you and I, a man had to be chosen, and that man was Saul of Tarsus, whose name was changed to Paul. And so Paul was going to suffer as a result of preaching that truth. Turn back with me to Acts 22. Acts 22. This is very clear. In Acts 22, <clears throat> verse uh, 17, And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. Now verse 21, And he, a reference to Christ, he said unto me, that Paul, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word. What word was it he said? The word Gentiles. Verse 21, he said unto me, Depart, I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. They gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices, and said away with such a fellow from the earth that is not fit that he should live, as they cried out and cast off their clothes, and on and on and on. 
In other words, they tolerated this man. They tolerated this man as he went into the synagogues and he preached to the Jew first and also to the Greek and on and on. But when this man stood up there and said, The Lord called me and sent me forth to go unto the Gentiles, he used a term that was despicable. In other words, their attitude is this. Here is a man saying that God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is sending him forth to bless them that have been cursing us. In Genesis chapter 12, the Bible said, God said to Abraham, I'll bless you and I'll bless your seed after you. I'll bless the ones that bless you and I'll curse them that curse you. Now you know something? When Paul said, the Lord is sending me to the Gentiles, in their mind is the idea that everything he's saying is contrary to Genesis chapter 12. God promised that he'd curse the ones that have been cursing us, and here's a man saying, God's going to bless them. This cannot be. It is not right that he should live. And they cast off their clothes, and the ultimate end was that they put him in prison, and he suffered for you Gentiles. Previous to that time, men were sent unto Gentiles who blessed Israel. But here is a man suddenly is to go to Gentiles who never blessed Israel. They cursed Israel. And in spite of that fact, God will save them. Israel is low am I. Israel is not a nation under God anymore. And God called this man and sent him out with a message of grace to you Gentiles. And when that happened, Paul began to suffer. Look at the passage in Colossians again. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 24, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Who is you? Look back in verse 21. You that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now they're reconciled in the body of his flesh, on and on and on. Verse 24, Paul said, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. You that were not in the covenants of promise. You that were without hope and without God in the world. You that were not a part of Israel's commonwealth you now can be saved by the grace of God. Why? The grace of God that bringeth salvation of the peer to all men. How do we know that? Through the Apostle Paul. Did we find that out through Peter's ministry? No. Did you find it out through John's ministry? No. Where did you find it? You found it through Paul's ministry and Paul filled up the sufferings of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Paul went to court. He was carried into court. He was tried and found guilty. And Paul was put to death for preaching the gospel to you Gentiles. And you find it written out in his ministry. Now, in Colossians 1.25, for if I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me to you to fulfill the word of God. In other words, if I study the Old Testament scriptures, then I find prophecy to a point up here. At a point in there, Israel becomes low am I. They are fallen. They're not the head anymore. They're the tail now. Later on, I find they'll rise again over here. And I find Hebrews through Revelation, the ministry to Israel. Therefore, there is a gap in here. There is a gap that the Old Testament prophet didn't know anything about anybody's ministry in that gap. Oh yes, I know there's always some smart aleck somewhere trying to promote his baptism or promote his uh, ordinances in the church or whatever. I know all that. He's always fooling around and twisting the scripture and adding to and taking from. But if you just let the scripture say what it says without finagling with it, it is clear. There's a gap in there. And this gap is very clear in the scriptures. And in that gap, the Old Testament prophet didn't know anything about God Almighty going to call a man and send him out to people such as you and I. 
it is clear that over here in the millennium that God will save Gentiles. It is clear that he'll save Gentiles who blessed Israel in the tribulation. But during this period of time, we're blessing nobody to get saved. We're not helping anybody to get saved, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now, John in his writings is not involved in this at all. You see, if Paul was called, verse 25, where if I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given me to what? Fulfill the word of God. In other words, according to prophecy, the, the prophecy would have come to like Acts 28. According to prophecy, it would have begun over here. Israel would rise and go across the board. But according to prophecy, there was nothing in here. So Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, fulfill the Word of God. They fill up the Bible. But that isn't all. Paul fulfilled the suffering of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Now that's what he said. That's what the passage says. Colossians chapter 1 verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Then the apostle Paul filled up the sufferings of Jesus Christ for you. Who did it? Paul? Well, how about John? Wasn't John exiled to Patmos? Yeah. Was he exiled to Patmos? for preaching to you Gentiles? No. How do I know that? Because Paul said in Colossians 1.24 that his sufferings filled up the suffering of Jesus Christ for you Gentile. Peter didn't fill it up for you. John didn't fill it up for you. James didn't fill it up for you. The writer of the book of Hebrews didn't fill it up for you. Who filled it up for you? Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, filled up the sufferings of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. You want to be saved? God will save you right now, right where you are, just like you are if you'll trust Christ. That's how it is. Jesus Christ died on Calvary for you. God Almighty made Jesus Christ to be sin for you and judged your sin at Calvary. God Almighty took your sin, placed upon His Son, and turned his back upon his son, and his son died at Calvary to pay for your sin. What do you need? Well, you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can have Christ right now, right where you are, just as you are. Receive Christ. Claim him as your Savior right now. Confess him right where you are. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I'm trusting Christ as my Savior. Claim him as your Savior right now. Won't you do it right now? If you'll receive Christ, God will receive you. I thank you for listening today. Until next time, good day.